Felix here, and <laughs> good morning to you. Um, staring at a, staring at a screen. It's a little bit like what Jay Powell did yesterday, or didn't he, with, with all those questions. He was just like, "Somebody get me out of here, please." What have you got this morning? Well, unemployment data. But before I show you the unemployment data, let me show you this. This is far more important. This is what my dog looks like at the moment. Look how dirty he is. Look how filthy he is. You can't see it. There he is. Look how filthy he looks. <laughs> Uh, he had fun. You want to see him playing? I'm sure you do. This is what parents do, right? They just force you to watch their children play. There we go. This is what he gets up to every single day. <laughs> this is what they do. They go to the forest and they get as filthy as humanly possible. No. Um, but I think you probably didn't show up here for golden retriever videos or photos, but you came here to see this. What have we got? I have not seen it yet. Initial jobless claims. Okay, let's take a quick snapshot of this. That's always easier. And the lovely thing is we are very likely to get Jay Powell being asked about this today. Well, if the senators can stop talking about themselves for a minute or two, they can pry themselves away from electioneering. They might just, just ask one intelligent question today, which I will live stream later on today. And hopefully we get something. I thought we did get something about sentiment yesterday. I think the, the recession is definitely a, a done deal. Let me just close the window. Sports cars going past, far too noisy. Right, we were expecting 227,000 people unemployed claiming joblessness for the first time. We got 229,000, so that's moderately up. The four-week average is also up. Okay, so this is a positive for the, uh, the cruel uh, capitalists that, that we are. Continuing jobless claims we are, are exactly as expected. So that's neither here nor there. But we do have a slight, ever so slight sliver of a slowdown here in, in, um, in the, the labor market, which is definitely positive. Oh, the current account deficit, by the way, that remember Trump was going to get a, do away with that? It's $291 billion. Uh, that's pretty, pretty monstrously large. So the whole tariff thing didn't exactly work out very well, did it? Look at that. So tariffs don't seem to work, do they? Not really. Well, there's also, of course, a problem. The U.S. is going to be not necessarily, well, probably exporting less as the U.S. dollar keeps ra rallying. And as the U.S. dollar keeps getting more expensive, this morning it's up again. It's at 104 against the basket of currencies. It just means U.S. goods are more expensive. So it's a bit of a problem. But Overall, the market is looking relatively green and chippy this morning. The slightly higher unemployment numbers will make us uh, feel a little bit more giddy inside. That's because we are, we are cold-hearted investors. And if you'd like me to keep covering this kind of macro stuff, live or, or not, would you let me know? Let me know in the comments whether you want me to keep doing this or whether you are bored and, and, and sick of job numbers and macro data. Let me know in the comments. So volatility down just a little bit more, edging here below 30 now quite quite nicely, and which means my, my VIX trade is going to come in nice and profitable, I think. It's actually a little bit in profit now, yay. And overall, gas prices and so on, crude prices, basically flat, so nothing really changing there. There is a big story there, though, which I do want to talk about on, on, on the gas front. But yeah, so this is, the, this is the key thing this morning. If you've just joined us in, Unemployment figures are slightly higher than expected. And that's good for the job, for the market. Not so good for the people claiming joblessness. But this here is um, what President Biden has on his bedroom wall. And it's the, it's the WTI Cushing crude oil first month 321 crack spread. Now you know what that is, don't you? I mean, I'm glad I explained it. It's basically the refiner's margin. So this is what this is. This is the refiner's margin. And what the president was going on about yesterday is that it's very high. And it is very high. Look, this goes back to 1993. It's super high. So are we being ripped off? Are we being milked at the pump? Well, yes and no. <laughs> and why the no? Because refining is typically a very, very unprofitable business. The margins are pretty low. They're pretty appalling. Nobody wants to invest in it because margins are like low. So why bother? So during the COVID crisis, when there was a lot less demand for oil, 
and, and, and fuel and petrol and stuff, at least initially, a lot of people, well, the, the refiners who had plants and they were thinking, well, we were going to close this one in two or three years anyway. There isn't very much demand now. It's going to be a recession. Why don't we just shut this thing down now? That's what they did. And they also decided not to invest in this because they didn't see for the foreseeable future there being substantial uptick in demand. And oh boy, were they wrong. And now there is this massive, massive profit spike, margin spike, and that's what supply and demand is. So if you really want to fix this, you need to create some sort of incentive for refiners to expand capacity. And of course, you could think of many things where, you know, some sort of capital expenditure tax breaks and you know that, that, that sort of type thing and uh, yeah, it'll always meddle with the market but that's kind of the thing you need to do but to build a refinery doesn't take a month does it it probably takes a couple of years after you've gone through all the permits and 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 done um you know environmental impact studies for the local toad population so this here is not something you can solve overnight except if you had really good relations with somebody who's got loads of spare refining capacity, that'd be nice, wouldn't it? You could just call them and say, hey, why did you do that? Well, there is somebody with lots of spare refining capacity who used to use it and export tons of oil refined into all sorts of gasoline products. The trouble is that that country is China. China has lots of spare refining capacity, but they have pretty much not quite outlawed, but made it put serious restrictions on the export of refined products. And why have they done that? Because they want to keep the energy for themselves. And, well, I suppose they're not necessarily in a particularly motivated place to help the United States, right? <laughs> because it's not been the friendliest of relations in, in, in both directions. So there is literally the China solution. So Biden is going to Saudi. Well, Biden should go to China. If he's going to be on his knees, that would be the, probably be the more effective place to be because that would actually solve even that side. <laughs> and uh, because they could simply ship refined product. The Saudis don't. The Saudis don't ship refined product. The Saudis ship crude. So... It's the wrong place where they're going. There we have it. So now you know something about the WTI Cushing crude oil first month three to one crack spread. So when you next person you meet and just say, what did you think of the three to one crack spread this morning? Pretty, pretty uh, incredible stuff, right? See what they say and let me know down below in the comments. So good morning to everybody. Um, Biden could also call Canada. I don't know if Canada has to spare refining capacity. No idea. Um, Oleg is making a good point here. Thank you for tuning in, Oleg. And that's the following. And you might think this is a German problem and me being a sort of German disguise. Maybe that's why I have a particular affinity. I, I, I don't. Um, but uh, Germany is kind of the heartland of European industrial output together with France and Italy. And they uh, have this three-step process of dealing with a gas shortage and they've just gone to step two. Now, step two is sort of okay, nothing particularly to worry about, um, but it does then permit in step three to ration gas. And that's a serious possibility because German law requires the gas storage to be at 90% by, I can't remember, October or something, September, and that's not happening. They're at like 50 something percent capacity. So gas rationing isn't really going to hit the consumer, but it hits the industrial customers because industrial customers use it for, um, well, you know, making stuff, energy. And if they did that, if they do do that, then you are going to get a significant recession in Europe because if the German economy goes down, so that's the rest of Europe. And what's going to, what's going to make this worse? Well, on the 11th of July, there is a pipeline uh, that's a little controversial between China, uh, Russia and Germany, and it's going into maintenance. Now, the concern is that when that pipeline goes into maintenance mode and shuts down, it'll never be turned on again because the Russians would need to agree to it being turned on again. We need to feed, feed it gas, and they quite possibly won't, at which point Germany is probably going to ration gas. So it's a, it's a really uh, significant and probably overlooked massive, massive recessionary move there. So you're going to end up with really high inflation and an energy shortage. Who would have thought? Well, who's celebrating? 
Bill Gates. Bill Gates is celebrating. He's on a yacht having a little party. Uh, and, and why is that? Because you smash the like button and, and just spread this information much, much further. You know, it's not just that, but he is a backer of nuclear power, right? He's an investor in the whole thing. And that sort of has been ESG rated. So if you thought that greenwashing wasn't a thing, well, I think greenwashing nuclear power has just been achieved and, 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 and Bill Gates is fully behind it. And of course, the Germans, lo and behold, switched off all of their nuclear power stations in some sort of green mania in, I want to say, early 2000s. I can't remember when. And you could think that's a good thing, and it is a good thing. I mean, I, I, I'm not a huge fan of creating waste that will be there for thousands of years. But they didn't really create the alternative. Instead, they just built, a, built more pipelines with Russia and relied on that. And that's, of course, a challenge. So now they're switching the coal-fired fired power stations on again, or they're switching the fuel from gas to coal where that's possible. And, and undoubtedly, they will import more um, French nuclear power electricity, which they're doing anyway. Uh, but it's still going to cause a, a shortage here, and it's going to drive energy prices up more and more as we head into the winter. And it's going to make Germany as an industrial high energy, um, you know, requiring sort of industrial output, aluminium and stuff like that. It makes it, it, makes it completely unprofitable. So they're not going to do that. So they're going to lay people off. They're going to shut up plants and all that kind of thing. So yeah, recession is here for Europe, for sure. So there we are. <laughs> Germany should invade Russia again. I think that's probably one of the least helpful suggestions, Glenn, if you're worried about inflation. I don't think, I don't think um, invading Russia would really help. Um, and if you're seeing what's happening in, uh, in, uh, in Ukraine, I, I also wouldn't really in, uh, recommend that. Uh, so good morning everybody good morning uh, uh cam uh, as well always great to see our coaching crew on here thank you very much for tuning in um what are you guys talking about you're talking about interactive brokers oh yes the the the, the lovely platform that it is we're, we're making more videos on it by the way we're going to make more short videos uh, for um, for so for you to understand the interactive brokers platform better because that, that's basically for all of our option students it's a it's a the platform you have to use if you're outside of Europe, of North America, basically. Now, before you do anything, I'd encourage you to download Goldman's top 16 stocks to buy. And it's at felixschwanzer.org slash top 16. And it's free and it's fun and it'll make you more informed. It'll, it's my research. It's completely free. Of course, none of it's financial advice. Don't just run and buy it. That would be really rather idiotic. And, and here it is in, in all its um, marvelousness. And, and Goldman says these 18 stocks will... Uh, report far bigger profits than the rest of Wall Street in this earnings seasons. So there's quite a bit of oil in here, and quite a bit of um, that sort of stuff, um, but also some other ones that are quite inter interesting. Uh, definitely worth looking into. Boeing's on here, cruise liners are on there. So yeah, have a bit of a ferret around this. Just click on open it, make, click on file, make a copy, and then you can search it, you can filter it, you know, you can put filters in. You just do that, and you hit filter. There we go. I've done it now. And then you can say, oh, I only want to look at the ones with the highest return on capital employed. And bang, you do that. And then you see it's Moderna. And uh, then you can look at the long-term earnings per share growth or, uh, you know, that, that sort of stuff. So uh, play around with it. It's, it's, it's very useful. That's why I make them for you. Felixvents.org slash top 16. There it is. Righty hope. Shall we have a look at the, 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 the market's reaction to what we just witnessed in terms of unemployment numbers being moderately higher than expected. So why is that so wide suddenly? Someone come in here with a really long name. It's just strange. So let me just show it to you. If you've just tuned in, here is the unemployment, the joblessness, the jobless claims numbers for the initial ones. So these are people who are freshly, newly minted unemployed people. There are 229,000 of them. We were expecting 227,000 of them. So 2,000 more showed up than expected in the line to claim unemployment benefit. And the four-week average, which is not the initial ones, but obviously more of an average, uh, is, is 223,000. Um, so going back four weeks. The continuing jobless, which are people who've been unemployed for whatever time period, is at 1.315 million, which is still historically low, but it is 5,000 more than in May, but pretty much exactly as expected. So that isn't really going to move markets, but this 
increase that we're seeing here of sort of four or five thousand uh, unemployed extra um, and the slight bump of um, from expectations to where we are right now is 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 a moderately positive sign for us as cruel investors because we want more unemployment because that will get us to the fed's targets and but it is it enough no it's nowhere near enough like you still have two vacancies for every every job. So why on earth are there 1.3 million people unemployed? They're either in the wrong place or they've got the wrong skills or the jobs are um, just not what they want to do. So it's, it's, it's one of those three typically. And, and, and so you, you will always have some level of unemployment. Zero unemployment is impossible unless you live in pure communism. And they've tried that. It didn't turn out so well. So somewhat positive. Undoubtedly, Fed Chair Powell will be asked about that today. Um, I, I, if, if I were a sanitized I'd phrase it something like, more Americans are out of work because of you. What are you going to do about it? That sort of thing. Um, and I, I will cover that again at, 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 uh, at 10 o'clock this morning, so, so, so shortly. So do join me for that. Now, let's have a look at where the markets are this morning. Quite green. GGPI finally confirmed that there will be um, a PSNY. There will be a, a, a proper IPO company by Friday, the 24th. And... That's taking the, the, the stock price to kind of new heights, 5% uh, up, 11.39, which is, again, quite nice and positive. Um, Chinese companies are flying, 3 4 5% up. Uh, Neo up to $23. Coinbase making a lukewarm recovery to 181. What's crypto done? Still above 20,000, that is. Bitcoin, Ethereum at 1,100, which is, um, well, if you bought it at 60, it's definitely cheap. And uh, here we are. Uh, so yeah, most things green. What's not green? Mullen, that makes sense. Verizon, BAC, uh, Pfizer, and, and everyone. wrong. So the, the bank's getting a little bit hit here. Um, possibly, possibly, because if you listen to the Powell testimony or his attempts to get a word in, to an intelligent question, there weren't that many of them, it was to uh, basically say, look, a recession is, he doesn't say unavoidable, but he says it's going to be very challenging to avoid. And, and this whole soft landing talk, I think, is basically going to go out of the window. So that could mean less rate hikes. Now, less rate hikes are not good for banks. If you're sitting on trillions of dollars of deposits and, and your business model is to, to, to rip off the depositor, as in the, the, the customer who put it there, then you want higher rates because that way you get more money from the Fed, from your, from your cash that isn't yours. And you're not going to pass it on, right? So, so that's a good thing for them. So banks generally benefit from rising interest rates, the faster the better, because they're much less likely to, to pass it on. Now, in the rest of the market, this is an interesting one. Bridgewater doubled down on short wages in Europe to $10 billion. So they're shorting 28 European companies, um, anything from ASML to Total Energy, Sanofi, SAP, and loads of other major European companies, because they're expecting Europe to sort of blow up into some sort of cataclysmic Lehman-like um, disaster because of energy shortages, high inflation, and, 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 and this impending loom and doom a recession. So that's Ray Dalio. Uh, that's what they're betting on. Um, I very much recommend not doing that because shorting can really, really go against you. If you want to, if you feel like a stock deserves to fall, there are much, much better ways of doing that. So you could do something like, um, you could do something like this. So say NEO for a particular reason here. I'm not, not saying you know you should, but just uh, uh, by example. Um, okay, maybe we can do something like this. Say you, you don't think NEO is going to, you think NEO is going to fall. So you could short it. And then if NEO goes up one cent, you're screwed and you're losing. Or you could do something like this where you can say, okay, by next Friday, the first, if I think a NEO is going to be below 26.50. So it could still go up $4. So you could be wrong by, a, a, by 18%. So it could go up 18% even though you strongly believe you should have shorted it. And that way you will make a, um, about a 10% return with an 88% probability. So that's the smarter way of playing it um, than, than just selling, selling the stock because your your downside your maximum loss is $45 it's limited it's not going to go it's not going to wipe you out if you're wrong so if you are going to make directional decisions on stocks 
be smart and do it with options. Don't do it with stocks. Don't short stuff. You're not Ray Dalio. You're not Bridgewater. You haven't got 10 billion lying around to do a wager with. So, so, so just don't do something more smart like this. And if you want to learn more about that, well, I, I, I'll, I'll, I'll teach you it. So, um, where we go? Here we go. Phoenixfriends.org slash options. Uh, that life-changing coupon that's been um, around for much longer than it should have done because we did a, a, a big, big seminar um, on uh, last weekend and, and lots of people are still asking and begging for it to be extended. So I will close it tomorrow, but check it out, felixrenzer.org slash options. And uh, if you have any questions on that or on, on anything, sort of how you become a better investor, simply head over to felixrenzer.org slash call and talk to the wonderful and amazing and charming Cheryl who's a US trained accountant and worked with me for over 10 years and knows exactly what I do. And she'll be very blunt with you and she'll walk you through it and talk you through it and answer all of your questions. So just go to felixfriends.org slash cool. Uh, we don't bite. Uh, it's, it's, it's completely free. Um, Um, I, I, am I treating you to, to Jay Powell today? I am indeed. Yes, there'll be lots of Jay Powell today. I will, I will be covering that in about an hour. Uh, absolutely. And I think uh, while in the, in the entertainment level is, is, is um, mostly for those of us who, who enjoy a little bit of pain, uh, I, I do think we get quite a bit out of that. And I think the level to which he seems to be no longer convinced he can do a soft landing becomes a bit more clear once he's answered the same question three times to three senators who are all in and out of the room and don't particularly seem to care about his answer, but more about their own political grandstanding. But still, we managed to get some information on that, which is cool. How do you transfer money into active brokers? Uh, I, I, I'm not their support team, but there is a little section in your account which tells you exactly how to do that. And they will give you um, methods of transferring and, and bank account details and so on, and a reference number you have to put in, and then you can simply transfer it in. So it's, it's a reasonably straightforward process. I hope you just have a, look, have a look. Otherwise, have a look in the help section, and you will find it. Um, thank you very much for your kind comments there. Love you too. How do you think the market's going to react today? Well. I think there is a slight positivity in the moderate increase in unemployment, but it's very, very moderate. So it's not like it's really going to solve anything, but at least it isn't heading in the wrong direction. It's heading in the right direction. So I think markets will be somewhat relieved by that. But what we are getting into now is this field of at what point does a recession become worse than high inflation or how about a recession with high inflation? What do we do then? Are we then really screwed? That's sort of where we seem to be heading. So I think the market has to kind of absorb that. And the market seems to take about a day or two to kind of absorb these things um, every day. Um, indeed, you heard the doorbell. Winston is going out again, yes. Um, and he's a very clean dog this morning. This is what he looks like. Look at that. <laughs> He's actually way, way, way dirtier uh, than he looks here. Um, and uh, I, I, I don't wash him. I don't believe in, in washing dogs. So he hasn't, been, hasn't had a shower in a year. But he does swim in the sea. So I think that sort of does the trick. Are the numbers good or bad? Well, the unemployment numbers, let me show them to you again, are slightly worse than expected, which from an investor point of view is slightly better than expected because we like people to be unemployed, apparently. Well, that's kind of where the Fed's positioned us and that's in a sense how the market positions us. So uh, the jobless claims, the four-week average is higher. It's higher than expected. It's about 4,000, 5,000 higher. And the continuing jobless numbers is also 5,000 higher than last month. That's a very small increase. I mean, we need to get you know, 50,000 or something on top of that to actually really move markets. But at least it's, as I'm saying, at least it isn't falling. So if unemployment was falling further, you would need to get bigger and bigger rate increases. Um, where do you live? That's a good question, actually. I'm in the south of France at present. What is JP supposed to say today? Well, he's testifying. He's meant to basically report on the state of the economy and, and that sort of thing to Congress. And that's a, that's a quarterly... Um, uh, sort of fire walk he has to go through. He seems absolutely de de delighted to be there if you watched him yesterday. It's quite amusing at times. But he basically gets pressed. So he's definitely going to get pressed on these uh, jobs numbers today. And I suspect the senators will sort of try and point this as, as a bad thing. And, and he's kind of going to be thinking, well, I think this is a good thing. So it'd be kind of interesting to see where they're going. But we did get the quality of questions improved with the time that went on during the hearing. The first lot asked 
absolute drivel. They didn't even ask anything at all, really. They just sort of talked around in circles or asked for uh, economics one-on-one -on -one lessons from the most senior economists in the country, which is quite peculiar, uh, rather than you know opening a, a children's economic economics book. But they, they, they did get better. So it, was, it is quite insightful, I think. How do you feel about Tesla? Is it more than an, an, an EV company? Yes, it is more than an EV company. Absolutely. Um, they do lots of things, lots of very exciting things that they do. Um, now, this is where we were. Let's have a quick look at what the media makes of the job numbers this morning. Bond yields sink on recession fears, futures gain market wrap. Okay, that's not that new. Let's have a look at Reuters. Can be a bit quicker. Germany triggers gas alarm stage two. Yeah. UK takes tender steps to its EU membership. Okay, that's more of a headline than really something that's going to happen. The experience that it is, okay, abortions, it's not really what we're here for, is it? No, they haven't woken up yet. They're basically all still nicely tucked in, these journalists. They probably think, if it's, if it's before 9.30, it's not part of my job description. Stock futures rise ahead of Powell testimony. That's also 43 minutes old. That's not really going to help. So what do you guys make of the federal gas tax holiday, if it does happen? It would potentially give you a 3 or 4% discount on, on your gas. And in my view, it's the, the biggest waste of money you could possibly conjure up. Uh, what is it going to do? Well, you're basically throwing, well, you refute. You're not taking tax income you would normally take, so it's the equivalent of spending money, essentially. So while I'm generally for lower taxes, what it does is it does provide some boost to the demand side of the economy, which is the very thing that the Fed is trying to reduce. So it's basically stimulus, and that just doesn't make any sense. What they should do is they should take that money if they wanted to and um, build refining capacity and of course that isn't going to fix anything in, in, in you know in six weeks which is you know what they needed to be fixed by so they can win the election but that would actually do something improve infrastructure but just sort of chucking it out there is just sort of like doesn't really achieve anything it's like sending stimulus checks to everybody in the nation why didn't you just send it to the people who actually needed it and kept the rest and spent it on infrastructure right that, that would have actually achieved something but uh, unfortunately politicians of all shapes and sizes and colors uh, tend to um, tend to think more about the new cycle and the new cycle is about six weeks uh, tops so that's basically what they're going for here so complete nonsense in my view uh, it's not going to achieve anything at all um, the, the, the problem is and we just looked at that the problem is refining capacity largely yeah there is the there is the um, <laughs> there is the oil price uh, and the oil prices is a big part of that uh, of course that's something but that's something you can't well, you can also influence um, by, again, incentivizing more oil production. Um, but this refiner's margin that's gone up from 20 to 58, that's the spread that refiners make, is, isn't, isn't that they're squeezing people. It's just that there isn't enough refining capacity. Very, very simple because refining has been a really low margin business and no one's wanted to do it. And everyone shut down their refining capacity during COVID and they sort of mothballed it and they had no intention of ever opening it up. And the only other place in the world that actually has refining capacity is China. <laughs> and China isn't exporting. And, and how do you motivate them to export when you've got tons of tariffs on them, right? So it's, it's, it's a load of things that come together. And, and that's the thing. Once you, once you start meddling with the economy by tariffs, by regulation, by tax, there is always an unforeseen knock-on effect somewhere down the line. And it might come in three years later. And this is it, right? So, you know, nobody wants to say, oh, sorry, it was me. Let me let's fix that. But there we are. Uh, lost in bigger care. Yeah, I actually just recorded a video on that. It's a, that's a sad story. Um, there is a um, an accident that happened at um, at Neo. Details are a little bit unclear, but essentially a, a Neo that looks like an ET5 or an ET7, a sedan, fell out. Oh, they've just responded. Okay. Um, two people have died in this. Two engineers apparently. And um, a new test vehicle fell, fell from the third floor of the Shanghai Automotive Innovation Port parking building, killing two digital cockpit testers. 
one of them was a new employee and the other was an employee of a partner. So I guess uh, somebody who makes uh, some of that technology. Uh, they're very saddened by the accident, uh, condolences uh, and so on. Um, it might have been an ET7, that isn't, isn't exactly clear. So it literally, very, very unfortunate, this vehicle fell out of, there are some pictures of this here, of, of them you know, trying to get into it and that sort of thing. Um, and um, where is it? No, that's not it. There were some more pictures here somewhere. Um, yeah, it seems to have literally driven out, um, obviously not intentionally. They, oh, they seem to have culled some pictures. I made a video on, of, of Adjust with, with some more pictures. I'll put that out straight after this. Uh, so yeah, very unfortunate incident. Um, two people died there. Unfortunately, manufacturing is a, is, 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 is still remains a dangerous thing to be in, and, and, and factories are, and, and yeah, no idea what caused it. I guess some sort of error, manual or machine or otherwise, and I, I guess we'll find out, but yeah. Um, well, they have no rail guards, you say, on, in, on that. Well, can you see the amount of concrete that's on the floor? They clearly took quite a bit of wall with them. Um, I mean, these are big, heavy vehicles, right? And uh, the car seems to have landed on its head. So maybe they flipped over it or something. Um, it's, just, it's just a tragic accident, really. Um, thankfully, nobody else was on the street. So it's just literally the, the, the passengers inside uh, where, where were killed. Uh, Gordon thinks it's an ET7. It might well be. It might well be. I, I, I can't really quite tell from the length of it and the, the squashness of it. Uh, but yeah, it's definitely a sedan of some sort. Uh, it's camouflaged, isn't it? Or, or maybe it's it's protective taping, I, I, one or the other. Uh, so it could be just, yeah, I no idea which vehicle that is, but it's some sort of neo sedan. Uh, so yeah, definitely not a, not, not, a, not a good story. But you know, for every report of, of a Tesla or something, uh, you know, killing somebody or hitting a tree. Uh, you know, there are, uh, of course, two dozen dozen Volkswagens and Volts and GMs and something. I'm not pointing fingers, but just accidents happen, and it's just unfortunately uh, part of what's going on uh, when you when you make new things, when you manufacture things. Um, righty ho, guys. So I'll be live again relatively shortly for the Jay Powell testimony. Um, it's it's. Uh, entertaining if, if nothing else um, but no i mean we did gain some insight yesterday It'd be interesting to see his comments on the unemployment data here today i'm fairly sure he's going to get hit over the head with that so do join me shortly and uh, i i look forward to that and if you haven't already uh, just come and book a call with us have a chat with us we don't bite and and you might just improve your investing skills and i say might because most people just keep doing the same thing over and over again, right? And sort of hope for, for better outcomes. And, and unless you actually change something and learn something, it's fairly unlikely. And, and you might walk away and go, okay, it's just motivated me to buy that investment book or do something little or just take one of our free courses or something like that. Um, I'd be equally thrilled with that because my whole, my whole mantra here is my whole mission is just to encourage more people to become better investors. And that's not hoping and wishing and praying and picking one stock and hoping the market will, will, will write it for you. It's just learning skills. And that can be investing, it can be trading. Um, and that's how you make more money. And that's how you make far more money than you ever will in a job. So that's really what I want to encourage you, get you guys to do. It's good to Felix Friends of call, book a call, uh, talk to Cheryl. She's very nice, very friendly, very charming. And she'll be very honest with you. And, and you might just say, well, it wasn't for me. It was for me. Oh, oh my God, that was exciting. I didn't know that. Or you might just walk away feeling a little bit more motivated. Either way, I'd be very thrilled. Thanks very much for tuning in. See you shortly.